from the time that the war started to now, like Russian people are watching Russian broadcast television, they see what and believe what? There's a peacemaking operation that Russia is waging in Ukraine. And you don't see any of the footage, just this incredible, brutal destruction, the shelled residential neighborhoods, the civilians uh, getting killed. But the biggest thing, I think, and I think this is even more important than the so-called factual information that people are getting, is how they're getting it, right. which is in this very routine kind of tone. The, the newscast at the top of the hour is still five minutes. Right. It's, um, there's nothing extraordinary going on. Yeah. We have seen the media crackdown for a very long time, and it's been ongoing and, and pretty brutal at times. Yeah. As soon as the invasion started, they blocked a whole bunch of independent media, and they passed a law making it punishable by up to 15 years right. in prison to spread disinformation. Fake news. About the war. Fake news Fake about news. the war. Which basically puts everyone who has been truthfully reporting on the war on notice yes. that they're looking at a 15-year prison sentence. Is it now impossible to be a Russian domestic, independent, factual journalist? I would say it's as, it's as close to impossible as, as, as it is without becoming North Korea. Right. Putin is waging a kind of information warfare that any seed of dissent will be stamped out because just people won't know. If I keep them in the dark, they'll never know, and as long as they're in the dark, my power is absolute. That is the strategy. I think it's working very well. How is he managing to keep Russians from knowing how many soldiers are dying. They have been preparing for this war for a very long time. And they've learned lessons from Afghanistan and Chechnya and even the last war in Ukraine. Now soldiers uh, are not allowed to have smartphones. So these young men disappear when they're deployed. Their families have no way of knowing that they're actually dead. A lot of things, either moral sanction, political sanction, economic sanction, all of it kind of premised on the notion that the only thing that will get this maniac to stop doing what he's doing in Ukraine is the crumbling of his domestic political support. The oligarchs will turn against him. There will be a popular uprising of some kind. Does that just seem like fallacious to you? Yes. Yes. Putin has been in power for 22 years. We know a lot about the way that his regime is structured, the idea that the oligarchs can turn against Putin. That is a lazy argument, because there are no oligarchs. What there is, is a mafia clan run by one person. That's part of it. Sanctions aimed at crippling the Russian economy primarily affect poor people. By poor people, I mean about half of the Russian population. And at the same time, the lifeline of the regime, which is proceeds from oil and gas, right. has not dried up. Right because the Europeans cannot inconvenience their people by stopping consuming Russian gas and oil. Don't tell me that that's moral sanctions. The premise of what the West's whole strategy is here, look, this war may be short or it may be long, but in the end, this is the end of Putinism. It's over. It's just a question of when. Do you think that's true? Let's say at some point in the not too distant future, there's some sort of partition of Ukraine and it allows Putin to, to claim victory. He then focuses on the crackdown at home. Meanwhile, in the United States, Trump or a Trump gets elected in 2024. The US pulls out of NATO. Putin goes back, takes over Ukraine, and keeps going. That is not the end of Putinism. And that is a totally realistic scenario.